Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. Gene Otis, you need to sit down. No, I wasn't talking to you, Daryl. I don't mess with state police. I, I just don't mess with them. They might hurt me. We're going to start with prayer, and then we're going to get right into music. We want to give our, we have missionaries here, a young, wonderful couple named um, Adam and Stephanie, and they have four girls. They beat me. They're raising four girls. No boys, four girls. That's a handful. Adam is vastly outnumbered. <laughs> Guess what? It doesn't get any better as they grow up. You think you're outnumbered now? You're really going to be outnumbered later, buddy. Well, it's great to see you here in the house of the Lord this morning. And we're going to worship, and we're going to have a great time, and we're going to learn about Papua New Guinea. Anybody here know anything about Papua New Guinea? You don't know anything. Come on. Oh, Shirley, she knows. Shirley's really smart, Larry. She's really smart, but she's the only one that knows anything. Well, Ben, ben knows something. Do you know about Papua New Guinea? That was a pastor joke. You see what I have to put up with? It's ridiculous. You know that? It is ridiculous what I have to put up with here. Well, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can meet in your house today. This service is all about you. You are the spectator. We are the participants. We want to give your name great glory and praise today. And we want to worship you in everything we do. We thank you for our special guests that are here, Adam and Stephanie and their wonderful four girls. And uh, we just pray you bless everything we do today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing with Adam and... Uh, not Adam. Adam's going to sing? Cool. <laughs> no, Doug and Kim. Whatever their names are. I don't know what their names are. All right. So uh, we have a song that should get you jumping a little bit. Comfort 
waiting for words. I'm never waiting on Kim. She's always ahead of me. Okay, we don't have a lot of announcements this morning, but um, on the last Sunday of the month, we are having a potluck dinner. I don't know why. <laughs> Nobody knows. Who cares? But there's a... Food! Bring brownies. <laughs> I don't care about that. No, I just want brownies. Okay, um, there's sign-up sheets out there on the bulletin board. So sign up to bring some food, okay? Diana wants to make an announcement. I'm just going to bring this over to her. Yeah. 
I just wanted to let the women know that we're going to start a Bible study at Bible Study Up in the middle of October. So it'll be the second week, second Wednesday in October. And we're going to do it on the, it will be on the, um, let me think, <laughs> the women of the Bible in the New Testament. And it'll be six weeks long, so we'll be done by Thanksgiving. Okay, all women are welcome at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning on Wednesdays. Okay, we're going to take our regular tithes and offerings in a minute. At the end of the service, folks, we're going to take up a love offering for our missionaries. Do you know that Adam and Stephanie are volunteer full-time missionaries? They're not getting paid. When we have regular missionaries come, they're getting paid by the general church. These guys aren't getting a dime. They're totally volunteer. So at the end of the service, let's take up a generous love offering for them that'll help them out. Okay, let's, let's do that. Thank you, Brian. A couple of announcements I'd like to make. Uh, make sure that you sign up for the uh, potluck. Uh, this will be on the 27th. We're going to be having a, a potluck for Lorraine and, and Brian. And uh, hopefully everyone will be here and we can just uh, have a good time with them. And a uh, couple of announcements. As you know, that uh, we need a, a uh, nursery attendant. Uh, and I want to open up any resumes anybody has that would like to be the nursery attendant um, and turn those into the office. Also, a secretary. We're opening up res resumes for that. 20 hours, 20 hours a week uh, for the secretary. And we need some resumes on that so we can get started on that. And... Um, so, and also we have a sign-up board out there the next two Sundays. If we could have somebody that would like to uh, work on an as-needed basis in the nursery, uh, we'd really appreciate that. And I'm going to be meeting with Shannon right after the services, and we're going to start trying to work out for our children's church. Uh, we might, we're going to need some volunteers for that also. So you'll be hearing more about that. And uh, I know this church is, is uh, we need some more volunteers. We need people. We need to bring kids into our, our church here. So we're just going to count on you to help us get through this time. And uh, I think that's about all the announcements I have. So can we have the ushers come forward, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you and this morning, we just thank you for the gift of love that you have for each one of us. How, through your grace, we know that, uh, that we have been saved. We know, Lord, that uh, through your Father, that, uh, that we will all meet together, Lord. And, Lord, we just give you praise and glory for all the many blessings that you give us, Lord. We ask that you be with us and guide us. Thank you for this offering that we're about to receive, Lord. And I just pray that, uh, that you would uh, use this, uh, that we would use this for your blessings, Lord. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. two that we're going to do are hymns and uh, one is my father's favorite and I haven't sang it in a long long time so 
I picked it out. It's a hymn number if you want to open your hymn, if you have one. We are getting some more. If you have not been told, that's when I start singing, you're going to turn it down. Um, <laughs> my big mouth. Um, it's, uh, we are having, there are more hymns coming. There is someone in the church that is uh, purchasing those and bringing us some more. So it's hymn number 141, The Old Rugged Cross. And we're going to do verses 1, 2, and 4. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So Number 357, if you want to use your hymn, and it's redeemed. We're going to do all four. Now I can't hear me. Child and forever I am. 
Charlotte are not here. They sent me an email asking me to pray because somebody that they know knows somebody in one of the Mideast countries and their missionaries are serving in a town that ISIS has taken over, which means that the missionaries' lives are at stake and they could be killed any time. And they ask us to pray. I don't even remember the names of the people. I'm sorry. That's my bad. But we need to pray for these people. Um, I've been accused of being too political. If I am, sorry. I'm not going to apologize for that. ISIS is killing people in the Mideast, killing Christians every single week, ladies and gentlemen. Every single week, they're killing Christians. And we need to pray that comes to a stop. And we need to pray that our national leaders will get our armed forces to do something about it. Because right now, we're just piddling around. I know that's getting political. Sorry. I just can't help myself. We want to pray for Adam and Stephanie. We appreciate your ministry. You've been in Papua New Guinea, how many, how many years did you say? Two and, Two and a half years in Papua New Guinea, volunteering. Would you stop and think about this for a minute? They're raising four girls, and they have no guaranteed income. Nobody's paying them. They have to raise all their own support. Do you know how much it costs to fly from the mainland of the United States to Australia and then to Papua New Guinea? It's big bucks. And nobody's paying them to do that. They have to raise their own support to even afford the flights. So we appreciate your ministry. We appreciate people like you. They're wi working witness coordinators uh, for, for this Melanesia, South Pacific, whatever that means. Okay, the whole South Pacific, they're working witness coordinators. Most of the work and witness teams are in Papua New Guinea, right? Most of them. And they got four adorable girls. Where's your, oh, you got one in the nursery. <laughs> She's locked up tight in the nursery. Does that say anything about the parenting of that little child? We'll, we'll, let, we'll let that one go. We'll, we'll just let that go, okay? Well, we want to pray this morning. And um, you guys, he's not here this morning. We need to pray for Adam Nash. Adam, Lash, Adam Nash lost his wife. And we did the service yesterday, and that's a significant loss. I, don't, I, can't, I cannot go up to Adam Nash and tell him I know how he feels, because I don't. You, some of you do. Many of you do. But I don't. So let's pray for Adam this morning. Let's, let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Father, we thank you this morning that we can be in your house. We thank you that we can come freely in here to worship and give you praise. We, I, we don't have to worry about anybody blowing up our building or shooting us when we come in here like some people in the world do. We thank you for a country where we're free, and we can come in here freely whenever we want. And we don't have to worry about stuff like getting blown up or anything like that. I pray for this missionary couple that Charlotte and Lynn told me about. 
Lord, you know where they're at. I don't even remember exactly what country they're in, but ISIS has taken over their town and is threatening Christians and killing Christians. And I pray for the protection of those missionaries and the Christians in that town in the Mideast and all over the Mideast, Lord. Christians are being horribly persecuted and, and, and murdered every day. And, and, Lord, I pray that somehow it would come to a stop. I, I pray that somebody would raise up an armed forces that, to, to put an end to this. It's ridiculous that this is even happening. And um, we just pray for those Christians in the Mideast, all over the Mideast, in, in several countries that are being persecuted by these barbarian people. We thank you that Adam and Stephanie are with us here today with their four wonderful girls. We thank you for their ministry in Papua New Guinea, and we pray that they would have enough support that they could, they could feed their family and take care of their girls and do what they need to do financially. I pray that they would raise the support that they need to, to do that, Lord. And we just pray you'd bless every part of their ministry. Lord, we thank you for Adam, Nash, and, and we had a good service yesterday. And he's got a good family support, but there's a big hole in his heart. His wife of nearly 70 years is gone. I have no idea how that feels. It, 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 it's got to be really tough. And we pray that you'd help Adam in these days and help his family, his son, his granddaughters. There's, all, there's a hole in all of their hearts. Somebody's missing, and it's Jeanette. It's her game. She's dancing in streets of gold in heaven. But it's their big loss. Help them in these days, mighty God. Help them in, in wonderful ways. Help our church, Lord, to make a difference in this community, oh God. Help our church to make a difference in this community. I, I think about the First Baptist Church and Marvin Owens. He's a good friend. And I pray that that church would make a difference in this community as well, oh God, that you would work through them and bless them and use them in, in every way that they need, oh God. And be with our Nazarene church over in Bend and Virgil Astron. He's a good, he and Judy are good friends and his wonderful staff there of that church. And Lord, just use them to make a big difference in the, in the bend and in the, in, the, in the surrounding area of bend. May they just be a, a substantial lighthouse to that community and help our church to be a lighthouse to Florence, oh God. That's what we're about. We're not about just serving ourselves. We want to serve people that haven't even come through the front door yet. We want to reach out and make a difference in this community. And I pray you'd help us do that. Lord, be with everything that happens in the remainder of this service today. Thank you for Adam and Stephanie coming to Florence today. And we just pray that we would be a blessing to them as they will be to us. And Lord, I know there's things on people's hearts here today. Stuff maybe I don't even know about. And we just lay those burdens down at your feet, oh God. We're trusting you for our future, oh God. We're trusting you for our future. And you're going to help us with whatever trials or difficulties or challenges that all these people that might be facing. And we're just going to trust you that you're going to help us. And we'll give you praise for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. We're going we're gonna to hold off on you guys just for one minute. Before our guests come and speak to us today, this is Alabaster Month, 
And we're going to put the large church back there next Sunday. And you bring your alabaster offering. A hundred percent, every dime that you give to alabaster goes to build buildings, whether it's pastor's houses or medical buildings or churches, somewhere in some country around the world. And we're going to watch a quick video of that right now. Are you ready for that? Do it. This is my son, who lives in Nairobi, Kenya. My son made an alabaster box in Sunday school. He and his family live in poverty. He learned that alabaster funds help build buildings around the world. Despite his living conditions and the immediate needs around him, he is collecting money for alabaster from his neighbors in the community. A simple faith, a trusting spirit, one life affecting many others. Alabaster, a ministry opportunity for everyone. Through your faithful giving to the Alabaster offering, God is building the kingdom. Okay, folks, if that little boy living in poverty can go around and collect an Alabaster offering, we can give generously to Alabaster. Amen? We can, and I hope you will. Okay, if you don't have an alabaster box, there's some out there. If you don't have a box, just throw money in the church next Sunday. We have two very special guests with us today, Adam and Stephanie Peterson. And as I've already told you, they're working witness coordinators at, on, at Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is a long ways from here. But Adam, or was it Stephanie? Which one of you is a native? Stephanie is a native Oregonian. Go Ducks! And you're a native, you're native to Oregon too. But you were raised in Oregon. Oh, I'm liking you better by the minute, man. We're going to be good friends. They're going to come and share with us this morning about their work in Papua New Guinea. Good morning. So, yeah, we're Adam and Stephanie Peterson, and uh, we've been blessed to work at Kujip Nazarene Hospital for the last two and a half years. We're the Melanesia... South Pacific work, Melanesia, South Pacific Work and Witness Coordinator. So uh, to decode that, that means we oversee Work and Witness in Vanuatu, Tonga, Fiji, Samoa, American Samoa, the Solomon Islands, and Papua New Guinea. And we actually live in Papua New Guinea. Um, up in the highlands, so we live at about 5,500 feet above sea level. It's about uh, an hour plane ride up into the mountains, and that's about the only way in. And uh, we actually live on a mission compound, so we are incredibly blessed there with a mission community. It's one of the last mission stations in the world for the Nazarene, Church of Nazarene. And on our compound is Kujip Nazarene Hospital. If anyone has ever heard of Kujip Nazarene Hospital, um, it's a Nazarene hospital, and uh, there are eight American doctors that work there, and the rest of the staff are all nationals. So on our compound, there's actually about a 1,000 people living, and um, it's been an amazing place to live and work out of. We've been there for two and a half years, and as Brian said, we are volunteer missionaries with the Church of the Nazarene. So this has been our first assignment, and we actually got hooked through work and witness. But... So, um, as we became, we heard the call that God said, it's time for you to become missionaries. I would never have thought that day came, because with my background, and um, I logged for four years right out of high school, uh, fell timber, uh, worked on large fishing vessels, and um, Stephanie was attending church basically her whole life, and we just kind of came together our senior year, two, two 
different people, completely different people, opposite side of the tracks. And uh, it, the pre, so we met in high school, and the prerequisite to dating me, my dad said, was that Adam had to come to church, and he hadn't attended church before. So I said, "Well, how long's church?" <laughs> well, so he, they said about an hour. I said, "Well, okay, I can handle an hour out of a week. You know, that's no, that's not too bad." And I uh, started attending Newport Nazarene there pretty regularly, and uh, didn't really feel the call yet. You know, I kind of was just sliding in and out, kind of being that back seat. Christian, kind of just doing his own thing and then hiding in the back, uh, did that for a while. Uh, and like I said, we ended up getting hooked through work and witness, so I kind of had to kick him out, him out, out the door to get him started, but uh, we got involved in work and witness right before uh, the earthquake that happened in Haiti, and Adam got the chance to go before, and then he got the chance to go right after and go do some disaster relief, and um, then I got the opportunity to go. So we kind of got hooked on work and witness, and um, in the meantime, um, my by trade, Adam's a certified welder, and I'm actually a dental assistant, but I've been staying home and raising the girls, and um, we had been homeschooling. So our hobby had been flipping houses. So we had bought our house, and we would do all the legwork and flip it and sell it. So we had had um, our current house on the market for a year, and not an offer, not going anywhere. This is when the economy was horrible. I, I had this dream that I was going to flip a few houses, get enough equity built up where I can buy some land, hunt out of my back porch, catch salmon, do whatever I wanted to do, shoot my rifle. And the Lord's just going to bless all this. He's going to say, that sounds great, Adam. Let's just make that happen. And I think we kind of had this vision that we were just going to hibernate in the wilderness and not have to talk to anyone and you know, play this little house on the prairie kind of scenario. But the Lord had other plans. So Adam went, ended up going on a work and witness trip to Paraguay. So this is my third work and witness trip. And I'm in Paraguay. It's a, kind of in the middle of South America. Uh, beautiful place. And I'm doing probably one of the most important jobs a person can do. I don't know if anyone went on work and witness, but you always kind of, they kind of tailor you towards your strengths. And I'm doing this project, very important. I'm on my knees and I'm building a retaining wall around a septic tank so the members of the church don't drive on the septic tank. So I'm down here on my knees and I'm laying brick and the work and witness coordinator for Paraguay walks up and he goes, Adam, what are you doing down there, brother? I'm laying bricks. He goes, you're awfully excited considering the smell and the work that you're doing. And I said, eh, I'm just glad to be here in Paraguay doing my bit, you know. And he goes, well, that's a good attitude. And uh, he goes, have you ever thought about doing missions full time? And I look up at him and I go, I'm not your man. That's just, uh, I think there has to be some kind of requirements or there's a mold or something. And I'm, I'm just not that guy. I know I'm pretty rough and. Uh, I don't know if I got the right background. I don't, you know, barely graduated high school. And I'm thinking to Josh Williams, who's the working witness coordinator, and I'm going, I just, I don't think so. He goes, I think you are. And I go, what could I do? He goes, I think you can be a working witness coordinator. And I said, well, I, I do like projects, do like construction. He goes, okay, I'm going to go make a phone call to Kansas City. <laughs> I kid you not. I'm, I'm laying brick, and Josh walked off to make a phone call to Kansas City. I'm shouting at Josh, trying to get him to come back. Josh, you can't do that, brother. You can't do that. I got to talk to Stephanie. And he goes, oh, no, I think, I think God's working on that, too. So I go through that whole thing, kind of nervous, wondering what's happening, what's going on. And I come up to the front porch of the house after all that long flight, and I got my bags. And I uh, look at Stephanie, and I think I should just get this off my chest as soon as I come in the door. And I tell her, and she goes, I've been feeling that, too. We didn't talk, never talked about being on the mission field together. And uh, I just kind of blurted it out there in the doorway. Stephanie heard it, and she said, you know, I've kind of been feeling that too. However, I said, okay, but there's going to be a fleece here. Our fleece is that our house has to sell. And um, so I said, okay, we'll fill out the form. We'll get started, you know, just a little hesitant. And, um, but so we filled out the exploring mission forms, kind of the first step. And within a week, we had an offer on our house. And I was like, all right, Lord, now we have to follow so, through. <laughs> a week. So two things came into my mind. I was like, why didn't I say I have to go on an Alaska moose hunt, too? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking, I should have, like, I should have kind of built the pot up a little bit. It's going to be that easy, but... So we spent the next year and a half preparing to get ready for the field, and um, it was a little bit of a roller coaster. It's a roller coaster. When you're diligently seeking God's calling for your life, it's not an easy road. That's when you're going to start getting attacked. And uh, I don't know if I'm not very bright or I have to learn all my lessons the hard way. It's just kind of the way I am. 
Uh, God was lighting our path literally with a candle, just enough for me to take a step. As long as I was willing to take a step where there was light, he would light the next step. And that year was tough. We had a lot of up and downs with the marriage. We found out we were going to have another child. We didn't know if it's four too many for the mission field. Uh, so it was a tough time. It was tough, but the Lord um, worked it out. He sent us a mission coach, which was an op awesome opportunity for us to just have somebody coaching us along the way and preparing us. We needed that year to prepare spiritually. And um, once we got the go-ahead to go ahead and fundraise, within four months, we were completely funded through pledges and cash, do cash donations wow. So for our last term. So it was a complete confirmation for us that we were going where we needed to go. So um, we have spent the last two and a half years in Papua New Guinea, and it has been amazing to be a part of that ministry there. That, the that the mission station itself and the church in Papua New Guinea has been there for 60 years. So I don't know if anyone's ever heard of Cindy or Wanda Knox. So in 1956, they also felt the calling at a young age, and they took, uh, I believe they had a newborn son at that period, and they heard the calling to go to Papua New Guinea. Now that flight is 16 hours for us now. That flight for Sydney and Wanda... Was just to Australia. Just Australia, 13 days. Process of getting to get all the way... 1956 takes 13 days. To get all the way up to... Pa, pa, in, to get all the way through Australia to Papua New Guinea took them 13 days, yes. So that's how far back the Kujip history goes. So this is a mission station that's been in the highlands of Papua New Guinea, 45 minutes south of Mount Hagen, and it's been there 60 years, diligently serving the people... And it was just awesome for us to be part of that, thinking that we are stepping in the footsteps of Cindy and Wanda Knox and many other phenomenal missionaries that's laid down the foundation. So when um, Sydney and Wanda came into the country, they looked around and the government had already kind of divided up plots of land for religious um, settling. And um, so he picked out a spot that's called Kujup up in the highlands. And there was nothing there at the time. Um, there was an airstrip about 12 miles away, and there were a few small towns. But um, he flew in and decided Kujip was the place. So um, he had the nationals carry all of their supplies in. It was a 12-mile trip by, by hand. They carried... They a had Sears and Roebuck's 1,300-square-foot home. Kit and home. pieces. So he hired for one cent a day, uh, probably around 60 nationals, and they would carry a chunk of this house on their shoulder for 13 miles. That house is still there. The house is still standing. But what's been awesome to us is today in Papua New Guinea, there's Kujip Nazarene Hospital, which sees over 60,000 patients a year. There is also three accredited programs. We have a, uh, three, three uh, nationally accredited programs. There is a Bible college, a teaching college, Nazarene Bible College, Nazarene Teaching College, and Nazarene College of Nursing, which is right there on our campus also. And it, it just amazes me how in 60 years, how far uh, and I, how much God has blessed the ministry there. These people are there. actively seeking education so they can become pastors. Pastors is not a highly paid position in Papua New Guinea. 80% of the country is unemployed. There's no money going to their churches, but they feel God's calling to become pastors. I have the privilege of uh, second day on station. Uh, Papua New Guinea is completely new to us. We don't know what to expect. We've read a little bit on the culture, but not, not real familiar with the area at all. And I run into this guy. I see a Papua New Guinean, and he spots me like he knows me. He's a pretty strong-looking guy, and he's 60 yards away, and he spots me. And I'm like, he's just staring at me. And he's not breaking eye contact. And now he's jogging towards me. I'm like, why is he jogging towards me? This guy's name's Appa. He has a, kind of a disformed hands. He only has a pinky and a thumb. Uh, he comes up to me. He grabs my face. And he goes, I love you. And he holds my face. And he's shaking it. And, he just, and then he holds me in a weird 45-second hug. I'm thinking, this is not American. We do not do this. <laughs> I have a comfort space. zone, and you are inside of it right now. And I, I, I kind of I, I get my hand in his, and I pry him off me, and I say, nice to meet you. Give me space. I need space. So Appa's just so excited. He goes, I just enrolled into the college. I'm going to be a pastor, and I love missionaries. 
It's been really neat to get to know some of the people there. It's been a little bit of a hard culture to work in. So um, when we are not overseeing t teams on the region, Adam is a project manager, and I work at I work for the field office from home, uh, processing all the work permits and entry permits for any of our missionaries coming into the country. So I work with the Department of Labor and Immigration, not the, the, not the, not the funnest job. But uh, Adam builds on station, so he's a project manager running a national crew. So uh, on any given project, I have somewhere between 15 and 25 nationals that I have to interview and hire for whatever project that I'm doing. And uh, we've been on the station about two weeks, and the missionary that also does projects and hospital maintenance is leaving for furlough, and he throws me the keys to the tool room, and he says, go ahead and finish those three houses. Right. And I said, uh, okay, um, do you have any instructions? Yeah, just make them look really good. <laughs> he said, let's go down to the project. It's probably best I introduce you to the crew. You know, Jordan, he speaks complete talk piss, and I speak no talk piss. So we go down to the crew, and I don't know if you've ever walked onto a new job site, but you got 20 guys just kind of staring at you. And they're kind of giving you the, the mean glare. So you got all these Papua New Guineans, and they're just kind of staring at me, thinking, good, another white guy's going to come in here and be our boss. So I could read this on it. I don't know how this is going to go, and I know right off the bat, I want to go ahead and just get in the ditches and work with these guys and earn some respect. And i got to know the language, because I need to communicate with these guys. That's, that's number one, is being able to communicate and show that you care and talk with them, because that's my ministry. These guys are, are non-Christian workers, and that's my ministry. So I'm on the project, and we're sweating together, and we're getting this building going, and, and I, I want to know Pigeon as fast as I can. So I stop him from working, and I point out a hammer. And I go, I hold the hammer up, and I said, what's the, what's the Pigeon word for this? And they all look at me, and they all yell, hammer. <laughs> I said, I said I, okay, either I was, I'm, a, I'm a really fast learner, or Pigeon's not going to be that hard. So I set the hammer down. We work for another couple hours, and I need a handsaw, you know, to finish making a cut. And I hold up a handsaw. And I look at him, and I said, what's the pigeon word for this? And they all look at me. That's a handsaw. I, for the whole day, every, every tool I held up was the same thing. Chisel's a chisel. And I'm like, you guys are killing me, or you're messing with me or something here. So I started to build that relationship. These guys love laughing at me. I'm giving them plenty of opportunity. And... Uh, it's been a blessing kind of working with the guys. I've done three major projects, pretty good-sized projects, and uh, I've had a good time. Yeah, since we've been there, Adams um, helped complete a new operating theater. So for those of you who don't actually know about the compound, uh, we have the original hospital was built in the early 1970s. Had its 50-year anniversary? Okay, so late 60s. It's the late 60s. And um, in 2009, they completed a new hospital. So we have a pretty cool new hospital that has 128 um, patient beds, and then we have an outpatient and a surgical ward. And um, so Adam got to build a new operating theater, a second operating theater, which is just an operating room. And uh, we have one missionary that's been there for 30 years, Jim and Kathy Radcliffe, and he's our resident surgeon. And just this spring, his oldest son finished his residency as a surgeon and has returned to Papua New Guinea to work alongside his dad and take over for his dad. So it has been really, really cool to be a part of that. So the American church, you guys, uh, through prayer and support and stuff, helped been to get the calling to work alongside his dad and also raised the money to build this operating theater. The church, or I mean the uh, uh, hospital administrator called me into a meeting and said, I'd like you to build this project. So I have the, the honor to, to give God the glory to use my skills to build this new operating theater. I, I already have some guys that I've, I've made a relationship with, so I got a crew picked out and we get to build a, a operating theater for Jim Radcliffe's son, Ben. To work, to work out, out of. of and you know even though we are volunteer missionaries there is no way we could be on the field in Papua New Guinea without WEF. WEF the World Evangelism Fund is the foundation it is the reason why the hospital is there and even though about half the missionaries on our station are funded through the World Division World Evangel Evangelism Fund as salary missionaries the other half are volunteers like us so um our boss likes to say it's innovatively funded, but right now through the Church of the Nazarene, about 60% of the missionaries are innovatively funded and are on the field and because of your guys' support personally. This, this so. world's not getting any better, and 
uh, we feel the calling, and we just encourage everyone to just uh, do what they can, listen to God, seek his word, and just go after what they can, what you can handle, and just let God guide you. He's guided us. Papua New Guinea. Yeah. So uh, looking now at Papua New Guinea and where it's at, we've heard some really cool stories lately of the nationals themselves being their own missionaries. We had over um, six, in the end of August, we had over 600 Nazarene pastors meet in Port Moresby for a uh, pastors conference. Some of them walked in for two weeks to get there um, by foot. The terrain and there's Think of like our, we got our coastal mountain range here that I, I've logged these hills. They're not, it's steep country. Papua New Guinea's steeper. It's taller, the brush is thicker, the rivers are flowing. Uh, it's, it's a crazy environment. And these guys live in it, these nationals live in it. And these churches uh, felt a calling to send their pastors out. And these pastors had a mission. We had one group from uh, the one of the Nazarene churches close to where we're at up in the highlands. So we're actually at 5,500 feet above sea level, like I said. It's a 10-hour drive to get to the coast on a logging road. And that doesn't even get us to the international airport. That gets us to the other side of the island. There is no road coming up from the international Port airport. Port Moresby is such a difficult place to get to that they'll, they'll probably never be able to physically build a road to the highlands to Port Moresby. The train is too difficult. So we had a group of eight pastors and a couple laymen that walked from Kujup. Um, it took them two weeks to get down to Port Moresby, and they do this every four years for the pastor's conference. This, this is their ministry. So I've met several of these guys. Jonathan, he's, he's been on Kujup. He's a good friend, and uh, he gathered up all his pastoral friends, and they said, we're going to make a ministry out of this. We're going to evangelize the whole walk down. And I, Papua New Guinea is divided up about 800 different tribes, and they've had a lot of tribal fighting. You don't cross somebody else's line, that's what they call it, their property, unless you feel very safe. I mean, you've got to be blessed by the Lord or on a mission for the Lord to even think it's okay to do this because you might get in a tribal fight. But these 13 people, 13 pastors and laymen, decided that's how we're going to evangelize. And these guys have lived and grown up in Papua New Guinea their whole life, they made this two-week, it was closer to three-week march down to Port Moresby, and they ran into tribes that nobody's heard of. They were passing through areas where they're still wearing the original grass tanket skirts and, you know, bare-chested. on top. Hadn't seen anything, you know, Haven't Western. seen any white people Western yet. Western style And, and they, they went through there and they evangelized. Now, how they, Papua New Guinea is very cultural. They're very, very communal. Very relational. Very relational. And they all sit around a campfire, kind of, and they tell stories well into the night. And every night they would walk 15 miles into, into a new group, a new line, a new tribe, and tell, tell them about Jesus. Tell them about what they're doing. Tell them about what the church has been doing. And it's just awesome to, to hear about people in Papua New Guinea being missionaries to Papua New Guineans walking to spread God's word. So like Adam said, the, the way the country's divided up and the lines and the tribes are, uh, there are over 800 different tribes in Papua New Guinea, and every single tribe has a different language. So um, they didn't originally communicate with themselves, you know, within the tribes, and um, we still today see a lot of tribal fighting. We're very fortunate that the being on the compound with the hospital, we're safe and we're looked out of. The neighboring tribes look out for the hospital. They are very, very grateful for the service that's provided there. And so we feel safe at Kuja. But it is very much a tribal culture, and um, you look out for yourself and your line, and they do a lot of fighting. And so we heard of, um, we have two graduates from the College of Nursing that just graduated uh, a couple years ago. So a little history about the College of Nursing is a program that's ran by nationals that provide our hospital with all its nursing staff. It also trains the number one most recognized professional nurses in the whole country. So all, all the hospitals want to hire graduates from Kujip Nazarene Hospital's nursing program. And it's pretty phenomenal. So these two graduates felt God leading them to go deep into the bush. And they ended up getting married. So it was a man and a woman. And they ended up getting married. And um, they went... Uh, so we're up in the highlands. They went the the country of Papua New Guinea itself is actually divided in half. If anybody's ever seen it on a map, the half of it 
There we go. So this is the Papua New Guinea half. That's us. And right up in the middle where it says Mount Hagen, that's up in the highlands where we're at. But the other half is Indonesian West Papua. So up there you can see the word. It's kind of small, but in the upper left-hand corner where it says the Sepik River. So they went deep in the Sepik. That middle line there between the orange and the yellow, there's nothing. There's absolutely nothing. No roads in. There, if there are missionaries in there, they're living one-on-one -on -one with the people group um, in a tribal setting. There are no towns, no city, no roads in except for bush roads. So this group, uh, this couple, and they ended up bringing another graduate with them from so the College of Nursing, decided that that's where they were going to go. And the town is called Bana. So they, they diligently seek God's purpose for their life and that a friend of theirs also that graduated from the nursing program had the call and the three of them set out to start a clinic deep into the remote bush now this clinic on its first day open saw about 150 patients these People... patients would walk two to three days we're talking with 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 nasty lacerations of the legs broken limbs and they'll walk three days People a Papua that New have Guinean, never had the option of medical care at I talked with a Papua New Guinean because I wanted to go on a hike. I'm kind of a venturous outdoorsman kind of guy, and I want to go on a hike. And I said, so how far would it take me just to walk from this town six kilometers away to this town? Uh, four days. How long would it take you? Uh, nine hours. They can hike. And that's two-day hike for them. It would probably be like a one-week, maybe 11-day hike for a, a white skin is what they call us, an American. Uh, it's unbelievable the distance they will cover to get some quality medical care. Medical care. So our boss was actually telling us a story, and he was sitting in on a national board meeting, and they were going through the notes, and he saw a Bana down there, and he saw it, and he took a break, and they were just kind of running through things. This meeting, meetings in Papua New Guinea go on and on and on and on and on because they're relational, and everybody has to, you know, share everything they know. And so he looked down, and he said, hold on, hold on a second. We need to stop here. What about Bana? Because about a year ago, I saw some funds come in for Bana um, that, that we had College of Nursing students going out, and um, they were going to start a clinic there. So whatever happened with that? So the guy that's in, in charge of rural area health, Gaby, who I've, I've worked with, and he's a good guy, kind of a uh, very timid, smaller-statured gentleman, just kind of whispers to my, to my boss, Harmon Schmelzabai. He goes, well, there's a lot of work going on there. And, and he goes, well, give me some, some, give me some numbers, because Harmon's a numbers guy. Give me some of the facts. And, well, they're seeing about 120 people a day. And, you know, this blows, blows, blows my mind to think of uh, a fresh graduate's nursing program in a rural area hiked in for days, and they're seeing 120 people a day. This unbelievable ministry there that, that we're part of. Yeah. And it doesn't stop there by no means. So this guy graduated from Kujip nursing college, but they also have to do uh, a lot of uh, Bible training and things like that, and he's also a pastor. Yeah, so actually he felt the calling to separately get his pastor's license while he was going to the School of Nursing. So being in there, they have also now planted a church in Bana. And so um, they have their family and they're living there. And so we need to be in prayer for them. And just as they're going out and being missionaries to their own country, um, it's just been it's been an awesome opportunity to be a part of that and to just see the fruit in Papua New Guinea. So now this, this new young couple diligently seeking God's work there in Bana is wanting to start a church too. So I don't know how many hours a week he's being a nursing uh, officer to the people, to the patients there in the Bana area, but now he also wants to open a church so that he can also feed them spiritually. We did just hear that funds came in for uh, MAF, Mission Aviation Fellowship, to fly them in a uh, solar power system. So they'll now be able to have refrigeration and have vaccines. and So it's growing, and it's just, it's just really cool to hear the reports come in. So I, I've been just, you know, sometimes in life, and I think well, we might pick God in a box. But I think we all need to just join in prayer as brothers and sisters in Christ to make sure that we just seek his will in our life and just pray for people going out there doing his calling. It's nationals. It's people all over the world. And just let his kingdom grow. And it's been awesome for us to be a part of that. 
Um, we thought maybe we would open it up just a little bit for questions after, uh, do we have time for that? Just a little bit? If there's, let's do the slideshow first, and then if anybody wants to ask us anything, um, we would love to answer some questions. Um, do you want to go ahead? Yeah.
Okay, we're not going to take much time for this, but does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions for them? <laughs> okay, for those of you at home, she asked, what other kind of critters do you have to put up with there? Go ahead. A lot of insects. So cockroaches in our house is a normal occasion. We have these yeah. things called banana spiders, which are about the size of your hand. Um, oh. You saw the creatures. Really, the... <laughs> really, there aren't too many actual yeah. wild animals. Flying foxes eat our bananas. There's what's called a flying fox, which is a giant fruit bat that is, eats our bananas. Uh, that was a cuss-cuss that was Rose. looking over the ladies. It's like a little friendly oh. possum. Uh, the big bird was a cassowary. Um, we do have rats and mice, but um, spiders. But there's no, nothing poisonous in the highlands, so it's too cold up there for poisonous no snakes. Po poisonous snakes no poisonous snakes, so... I wouldn't be there if there was. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be there either. Okay, anybody else have a question? Yeah. What was the horns you were holding up, she said? There, there is a uh, Rusa deer, but they're, they're down on the coast, and they're over there on the West Papua side, so there's no way to hunt them, but they do have some deer uh, on the West Papua side. So occasionally we see the nationals, you know, they've probably just traded something for a set of horns. We see them on the front of their vehicles. They were um, imported in or whatever from Australia. So they're kind of wild down on the coast in certain areas. Okay. You make your own lumber. Now, make that's a tough question. Getting building materials is incredibly hard. And what you get to do if you want to build is you basically need to go for a hike out into the bush. You get to pick out the tree. It's a eucalyptus tree. They call it a gum tree. And then you got to negotiate with a Papua New Guinean who has a portable sawmill to cut that tree for you. And then he hires his boys. That's what they call them. And they carry the lumber out on their shoulder. Amazing. Now, there are some lumber stores, and there is some other products available, but Adam has to take a 10-hour drive on a gravel road down to the coast to get those. Hire a truck, praying that it doesn't get robbed on its way back up to the highlands, and have them truck it up. So about four time, three to four times a year, he has supplies brought up. So when he buys supplies for a project, he buys every single thing he can need, brings it up, puts it in a warehouse, because there's no guarantees that you will ever find it again in country. Uh, missionary very, kids? There, there are very many kids in the compound, yeah. Yeah, we have 13 missionary families or singles living on station. About half of those have kids our kids' age. There are 10 American kids. Well, three of those are Swiss that come from a neighboring station. 10 children at the elementary and 7 at the high school. So our kids are blessed to have, um, you know, they play with the nationals, but they're blessed to have a little piece of home there on our station. I saw them playing in the mud. Like that was them. a nice arousing game of mission kickball in the, on, in the, in on the, the pouring rain. It rains about every afternoon. Right now they're going through um, a very rare drought. Um, the last drought they had like this where it hadn't rained in months was back in 1997. Uh, last year we uh, – what is the average rainfall though? 250, Let's just say it's very tropical. So every, it's about it stays about 75 degrees year round, uh, but we have rainy season and rainier season. So, but they're going through a drought right now. That um, we last year we were blessed to have a new hydroelectric dam put in, so that the our old one broke. And um, in order to keep the hospital running, we need reliable um, electricity. And in the meantime of building a new one, we had over how much in medical equipment? Over 100,000, hundred maybe closer to 200,000 U.S. dollars worth of medical equipment was damaged by poor power uh, provided by the country's power. The, po the power is not very consistent there. So having your own hydro is a blessing. But you can pray right now for Papua New Guinea. We've had some staff houses burned down, and this is the first time ever since we've been there that we've heard of fires, you know, unintentional fires in the highlands. And um, our hydroelectric dam that we we're blessed to have finished last year has been just 
an amazing blessing. They actually had to turn it off about a month ago because of low water warnings because the river is too run to lo- too low to run it. So um, the missionaries are running out of water in their tanks. We collect rainwater. So um, they're going through a very hard time right now. And you thought it rained a lot here? And they get 150 to 200 inches a year, except when it's drought. And the droughts don't come very often. When I'm doing projects for about three quarters of the year, it rains at three in the afternoon, and that rain, it will drop over an inch, two inches in just that one day. Any other questions? Any other other questions? Shirley, go ahead. What do they normally eat? Well, I go into town, which town is Mount Hagen, which is an hour drive away. It costs us 100 U.S. dollars to drive into town in fuel. So I go in once a month to do grocery shopping. I buy in bulk, and I cook everything from scratch. So if we want tacos, we have to make everything from the tortillas to the salsa to the... So, But we can buy hamburger and chicken and flour and your basic staples. So I do a lot of cooking and baking. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Kyle, go ahead. We do have a garden, and I have a, everyone has a garden. Uh, The nationals live off their gardens, and that's why this drought is hurting them so bad right now. The gardens are all dying. Um, I have a garden, and I have a garden. Mary is her, and she comes in once a week and helps me in the garden. There was a picture there of the girls. They were working on our pineapple patch, so uh, we've enjoyed some of the tropical staples. Fresh pineapple. Are you kidding me? Bring it in. It's been warmed by the sun. I can say specifically for us, Adam probably has something else he's thinking, but um, when Adam started going on Work and Witness, we had a set of friends who they're actually in their late 70s now. It's actually Adam's hunting partner now. And um, they were mentors to us. They were from when we were a young married couple through our, our years of developing as Christians and raising a family. They were there for us. They were encouraging us. And I would say that right there helped us to get us where we are today and make us, we had that backup that made us strong enough to be able to step out on faith and do what God had called us specifically to do. His question was, how can we replicate what they're doing there here in the United States? Mentoring, partnering up, looking for ministry opportunities, and and going with whatever you're passionate about, and finding like-minded people that are passionate for the same thing, and and actively seeking it, praying for it, and building each other up. Like Stephanie said, Jerry and Judy built us up, else we would have just fell to the back row and never left it. So this 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 strong couple, and they. They just took us into their home, fed us. We played pinochle in the evenings, and they built us up. He invited me to go hunting with them, and that relationship fired me up. And then I, I also did local missions for the, for the church before I went to Papua New Guinea, and I, I encouraged that, trying to find ways to help your community. We didn't, wasn't just inside the church of the Nazarene. Uh, you know, somebody that needed help, we'd help them. So, As far as what's going on there... 
Uh, as Americans, we're spoiled brats. <laughs> I hate to say that, but we, we are a throwaway society. It's we true. have anything we want. We can walk out and get anything we want. They don't have that there. They're fighting to survive. It's a reality. Their gardens are dying right now, and people are dying for no reason except for they're starving from food or have lack of medical wherever they're at in the country. So the people are hungry for the gospel there, and we should be hungry for it here too, but I think so many people are so reliant on just their creature comforts and the things that are available in America that they think they don't need it. You're right. You're exactly right. It's what, we're, we're a bunch of spoiled brats in America. Well, not in this in room right now. <laughs> not, we're, we're exceptions, I'm sure. Okay, any other questions before we wrap it up? Okay. Thank you, guys. You are wonderful. <laughs> Note that Ben went home and he's not doing well, so we're going to pray for Ben. And ushers, if you'd come, we're going to take a love offering for Amy and uh, Amy. <laughs> Adam and Stephanie. I know your names. I'm just faking it. Lord, we just thank you for their presentation today. Mo more than that, Lord, I thank you for their ministry working in very primitive conditions where they don't have things as easy as we can just run down to the store in five minutes. They, they can't do that. So bless their ministry and may we just give to them richly and generously and be with Ben, Lord. He's having a hard time and I just pray you'd help him in every way that he needs. Physically, you know, just raise him up and touch him, oh God. Just help him, we pray. And bless this offering in Jesus' name. Amen. I could sing for an offertory. No, why don't I not? Why doesn't Kim play? stand up and go home <laughs> you are dismissed if you want to come talk to Adam and Stephanie go right ahead <laughs>